is risen. Uh, great to hear this morning. This is why we're here. This is why we do everything we do every Sunday. Every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this should be no different except that we set one side a day a year to celebrate this, but he is risen and every Sunday is the Lord's Day because of that. So good to have you here at our inaugural 730 service. Wow, thanks for coming. Good turnout. It's good to see you this morning. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we're grateful for the victory of Christ our Savior over sin and death on that first day of the week, the Lord's Day. We're grateful, Lord, that we are participants in that in that we have been crucified with Christ and buried with Him and raised with Him and seated with Him in the heavenly places. What incredible truths those are. We latch on to them this morning and we pray for eyes to see the wonderful truths you have for us this morning. And I pray specifically if there are those who have not seen and understood by the light of Christ what He has done for them, that you would help them to see that truth this morning. For these things we pray in the name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, we're going to read from Luke's first 12 verses of his account of the resurrection. You know there are four accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Each one have a different perspective. Luke, as it turns out, was not there But he was a historian, and he interviewed many eyewitnesses and filled in a lot of blanks, and so he told the story from the eyes of those who were there. So Luke chapter 24, uh, verses 1 through 12, and would you stand as we read God's Word? We do this at Valley Bible Church because there is a tradition in the Old Testament, but also Paul said, please give attention to the reading of the public reading of Scripture. We believe that this is the moment that God truly speaks to us, uh, and we know for certain this is His Word. So Luke 24, verses 1 through 12, please give attention to the reading of God's Word. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, Behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified And the third day rise again. And they remembered his words and returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now they were Mary Magdalene and Joanna uh, and Mary, the mother of James. Also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. But these words appeared to them as nonsense and they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen wrappings only, and he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. And God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Things going as expected for you? How was your week? Good, good. Everything go swimmingly throughout the week? Perfectly for you? Mine didn't. Um, this is Easter week, an important week of the, uh, of the church, of course. And uh, several weeks back, I'd planned out everything that was going to happen and what I was going to do. The wheels came off of that plan completely this week. That's okay. I'm not going to go into any details, but uh, the wheels did come off. And how about you? How was your week? I mean, everything go just as you planned it? That work was perfect? Your relationship with your your kids and your spouse, just the way you planned it? Family, school, wonderful, right? Everything? Or did things happen this week that you didn't really see coming? 
Some did for me, that's for sure, and I'm sure for many of you as well. How about your life? It's going perfectly. From the very beginning, you planned school, who you would marry, and how many kids, and your career, and everything just went just the way you planned it, right? We had a couple in our church who have since died, and, and I always said that they lived a charmed life, and, and it seemed that they did. Um, they were attractive, they were educated, they were uh, personable, witty, humorous, incredible couple, a lot of fun to be around, always the life of the party, and, and um, successful. Um, his career was incredibly successful. They always had enough money, retired early, they did world travel, um, raised wonderful kids, had grandkids. Everything seemed to go well for them. They had a lake house and a house in town and incredible people. They loved the Lord. They knew the Lord. Then about 90, things changed for them. She had heart problems. He got prostate cancer. He died before her, and then she died. But even in those days, they kept their sense of humor and they said, we have, we have no complaints. God has been good to us. We've lived a good life. And then there's the rest of us. Didn't quite go that way for the rest of us, right? The way we had planned it. Um, unexpected things come into our lives. And maybe you are still rocked to this day by something unexpected that happened years ago. An unexpected pregnancy an unexpected death of a child, an unexpected divorce, an unexpected death of another loved one, an unexpected financial crisis because of a change in career that you didn't see coming and it blindsided you. Unexpected things have a way of coming into our lives. And you may have been dealing with those for many years. But this morning we see God does the unexpected. God does the unexpected. He does the unexpected in our lives. And by that, by that I don't mean he's always kind of waiting to trip us up like some leprechaun, you know, ha, gotcha, none of that stuff. We do understand that every thing that comes into our life, every trial, every suffering comes through his gracious hands because he is sovereign and he knows what's going to happen, and, he, and those things he allows in our lives. But he also does unexpected good things. And if you are new to the Christian faith, stick around. You're going to see that. I hope you've experienced those unexpected good things that he's done in your life. For me, the way I oftentimes see it is in, in prayer, the way God answers prayer. I pray for things, and God answers those prayer, and sometimes it's like, uh, he answers in, in such unexpected ways. I didn't see that. In a million years, I would never have it expe expected you to answer that prayer in that way. He has an unexpected twist. Have you ever noticed that? He is infinitely creative, eminently in control. And so he does those things in our lives to show us, I'll answer my prayer, your, your prayer, but I'm going to do this my way, and I will delight you in doing it my way. Makes me smile. Our passage this morning is about the disciples slowly coming to understand that what they thought was unexpected was really God's plan all along. Many unexpected things came into their lives, but it was God's plan. It says this in verse 1, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. First day of the week, that's Sunday, that's today. Early dawn, literally says in the deep dawn. So they came as soon as it got light, and they came bringing spices to the tomb because they were going to anoint the body of Jesus. The setting is Sunday morning. Sunday morning, the first day of the week. But the background... It's Friday afternoon. If you were at our Good Friday service, you saw what happened on that Good Friday. Many bad things happened, horrible things. And think of all the unexpected things that the disciples witnessed. 
They didn't expect that one of their own would betray him. They didn't expect that he would actually be arrested, that he would then be charged with something he had never done. They would probably, were probably thinking at the time, well, these charges are stupid. We know he's innocent, so we don't have anything to worry about because uh, justice will prevail, right? That's what we would think. No, it didn't. He was innocent. 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. He was a sinless Savior. He was innocent, righteous in all things, but suffered for us. They didn't expect then that He would be sentenced to death for those things, and they certainly didn't expect the brutality of His beating and being spit upon and, and uh, mocked and scourged and nailed to a tree. Some of the most horrible things ever done were done to the most innocent man ever. In fact, the only innocent man who ever lived. And the horrible things that done to him were unreal because he was hated. We hear a lot about hate today, and it's real, of course, and and hate blinds people to truth. Think about these religious leaders. They were blinded by their hate so much that no matter what Jesus did, they would never accept him. I mean, he did good things to people. He healed people. He made people happy. He taught, and the people were excited, and they hated him for it. They hated him for it. And then there's Pilate. Pilate, who actually ended up sentencing him to death, he didn't hate Jesus. He didn't know him. He didn't have a dog in the fight. But he was a politician, so need I say any more? He did what was expedient for him. When blind hate intersect with selfish ambition, it's a train wreck. It was a train wreck. Train wreck of sinful humanity perpetrated on an innocent son of God. And I'm sure the disciples, even at that point, didn't expect him to really die. And they didn't think that it would happen so quickly. Yesterday, we were happy. Today, he's dead. They must have been stunned and in shock. So in chapter 23, it says, after they had laid him in a tomb, Joseph of Arimathea, chapter 23, verse 54 says, it was the preparation day, that was Friday, and the Sabbath, which began on sundown on Saturday, was about to begin. Now the women who had come with him out of Galilee, that's an important point, they came with him from Galilee, and they saw the tomb, how his body was laid, but the sun was going down, and they returned and prepared spices and perfumes. Why? To anoint his body. We know that he was buried by uh, Joseph of Arimathea, and about 70 to 100 pounds of spices were already applied to his dead body, but they were going to come as a final act of devotion to him. But on the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. These women were believers in God. They followed the commandment, and they were going to violate the commandment to go into a place of death and handle a dead body. They were faithful to the Scriptures. And then it says... In verse 2 and 3, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. When they arrived, what they were expecting, they did not find, and what they did not expect, they found. On the way, they were saying to one another, who's going to roll away the stone for us? Because they knew that it was, they had seen this happen. The stone was placed in front of the opening to the tomb. And they're wondering, how's this going to happen? I don't know what they were thinking. Eyes of faith, I don't know. But when they get there, the stone is gone. They didn't expect that. Certainly they would have been, hmm, didn't expect that. And they were curious. So they go in. And they did not find his body. They expected to find it. That's why they came, because they had spices to anoint him, but it wasn't there. They did not expect 
what happened. And so far, everything that has happened is negative. And there's a lesson for us in these first couple of verses that there is a devotion to God that looks past the unexpected. If you haven't noticed yet, the unexpected is going to happen in your life. It's okay. But a devotion to God, a real faith in Him, looks past that and and trusts in Him as a person, in His faithfulness. These women were believers. Why did they go to the tomb? Because they loved Jesus. Why did they love Jesus? Because they had a relationship with Him. They didn't believe in the resurrection yet. But they believed in God beyond the circumstances. They had a relationship with Him. And being devoted to Jesus does not mean that we will never experience trouble. In fact, the opposite is predicted by Jesus Himself. He said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome this. He has overcome all the unexpecteds of life by His death and by His resurrection. So we shouldn't worry about all the things that are happening. Instead, we should trust because if we, tr- if we are worrying, we are, we are not trusting. I, I came across a, uh, a quote yesterday by Tim Keller. He said, Worry is not believing God will get it right, and bitterness is believing God got it wrong. When we blame all the unexpecteds on God, and he ha- does not have our best interests at heart. So, how about you, your devotion? Do you, are you a fair-weather Christian? You trust Him when everything's going well, swimmingly, wonderfully, as according to plan? Or when the rug is pulled out, do you trust Him? Does, it, does your devotion to Him go beyond the unexpected? So far... All the disciples think is that God's plan has been frustrated. But verses 4 through 9 show us this, that God does just what He says He will do. God always does just exactly as He says He will. And again, the passage is, is about the disciples slowly coming to understand that the unexpected, all these things were part of God's plan to begin with. Verse 4, while they were perplexed about this, can you, ima- you can imagine they were perplexed, they come in, hey, the stone's gone. Hey, his body's gone. You, you know, you've been there where you, circumstances are just strange and you're trying to figure it out and a million thoughts are going through your head all at once. And it says that while they were perplexed, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. Notice the words, Behold, that gets our attention. Two men suddenly stood before them. That gets their attention. In dazzling clothing, that gets everybody's attention. For some reason, these men appear out of nowhere. Maybe they were there and their presence was hidden to them, but all of a sudden there is this dazzling appearance of these two men. And they are angels. Later in the chapter, it says these men are angels. And this word dazzling was used of uh, Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, and it means gleaming, and it's often used of lightning flashes, and so it's not like just a bright light bulb. There's motion in this light that's gleaming and flashing in these these angels' clothing. And verse 5 says, And as the women were terrified, everyone who comes into contact with the heavenly is terrified. They recognize them that they are in the presence of divine messengers, heavenly beings. And they bowed their faces to the ground. I think they're really on the ground. And the men said to them, why do you seek the living one among the dead? Why are you in a tomb looking for Jesus? Why, it's like, why are you in a cemetery looking for your loved one who's alive? I think their gravestone is here somewhere. No. Why do you seek the living one among the dead? These women go from being perplexed to confused to terror. And they realize this. And in verses 6 through 8, he continues and he says, He is not here. He's not in the place of death. 
but he has risen. Those words, he has risen. Change everything. Change all of those unexpected circumstances that preceded it. He has risen. And then he says, remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. And he says, recall these words. And this is what he said, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and he must be crucified, and he must on the third day rise again. This is a word, the must, means it is necessary. This is the divine necessity of God that Christ would die and rise again. It was necessary for him to be delivered. It was necessary for him to be crucified. It was necessary for him to rise again. Jesus is not in the tomb, and you know why? The reason he's not here is because he's not dead anymore. He's alive. He has risen from the dead. And remember what he said. So what happens is not a surprise because Jesus has told him this. It was God's plan all along. These are the words of Jesus when he was talking to them previously in the, in the life of uh, teaching his disciples. In chapter 9, it says this. But he warned them. This is after he said, who do you say that I am? They, they said, well, you're the Messiah. And he said, I'm warning you. Don't tell anybody about this, that I'm the Messiah. This is called by scholars the divine secret. They didn't want the word to get out, and even the disciples didn't understand it. He didn't want it to know because people to know so that people don't get the wrong idea too soon. And he was saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Pretty explicit. He told them back when they were in Galilee, this is what's going to happen. It must happen. I'm going to be turned over. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I will rise. He told them that. Why didn't they remember? Later on in this chapter, in verse 45, 44 and 45, it says, let these words sink into your ears. You see the figure of speech? You need to let this penetrate, not just your ears, but into your, your mind and your heart that you understand these things. Let us sink in. For the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this statement, and it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about the statement. They heard the words, but they're going, we don't get it. What are you talking about? Chapter 18, verses 31 through 34, Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished for he will be handed over to the Gentiles and will be mocked and mistreated and spit upon. Look at the specificity here. That's exactly what happened to him on Good Friday. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day he will rise again. But the disciples understood none of this. And the meaning of the statement was hidden from them. And they did not comprehend the things that were said. There are a number of reasons why they didn't remember. Obviously, one of them is God hid it from them. They could, un they could understand the words. They could remember the words, but what they meant, it was beyond them. Jesus often spoke in parables what appeared to them as riddles and, and, and metaphors. And there were many times where they were going, I, we don't get it. What are you talking about? And he would say something to the crowds, and later on he would explain it to them, and then they still didn't get it. It's okay. There's this unfolding revelation and understanding of the disciples. They should have been able to remember the actual words, but the meaning, the meaning of them, what the significance was hidden from them by God himself. Two things about this. The resurrection was the fulfillment of Jesus' teaching. He said, this is what's going to happen to me. It happened. Everything that he said happened. So what Jesus predicted came to pass, and he can be trusted. Second of all, the resurrection was the fulfillment of the promise of Scripture. 
Everything that was predicted about him in the Old Testament came to pass. And he fulfilled all that was found in the scriptures. Let me just read a, a few to you. Genesis 3, 15. Beginning of the book, beginning of the story. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed is going to be the Messiah. He shall bruise you on the head. He's speaking to um, the, the serpent, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Jesus crushes Satan at the cross. The seed of the women. Women don't have seed, but she would bear a Messiah eventually. Genesis 20, uh, 22, the Lord said to uh, Abraham, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the star, stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That is the promise of the Messiah, that one day the seed of Abraham, the seed of Israel, Jesus the Messiah, would be born and raised and die and rise again. Later on, in the book of Isaiah, who has believed our message and to whom has the name of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He had no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Isaiah was writing a, a vision that he had seen, and he writes it as, it as if it had already happened. Because in the mind of God, in the purposes of God, it had. And he is speaking of the suffering servant, the Messiah, Jesus. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. He was hated. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried and we ourselves esteemed him as stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. God was doing this for us. Because, but he was pierced through for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourgings, we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears, he did not open his mouth. He could have said, I'm innocent. What are you doing? I didn't do anything wrong. Why didn't he? Because he was taking our guilt and we cannot say that. He was speaking or rather not speaking for us. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who is considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, Joseph of Arimathea, because he had, not done no, he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He was sinless. But the Lord was pleased to crush him. That doesn't mean God was happy to do this. It means it was his will to do this, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, and notice this, he will see his seed. The seed, all through Scripture, fulfilled in Messiah and Jesus. But you see, that's a, a picture of resurrection. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in the land. So it was prophesied in the Old Testament and was prophesied by Jesus. The resurrection fulfilled the words of Jesus and the resurrection fulfilled all that the scriptures had said of him. His death was not just physical. It had spiritual implications. It accomplished something. As he was dying to take the place of those who are guilty, he died a death we don't now have to die. We don't have to die that death. We die, but we don't die eternally because he removed eternal death by taking our sin on himself. If he had just died and stayed dead, 
His death would have been meaningless. He was just a martyr for a cause. Oh, what a good guy. Took one for the team. His death was real. His resurrection was real. Not spiritual, not metaphorical. He wasn't speaking in a parable. It was literal. And it secured our forgiveness of sins. It was God's seal of approval of the entire mission of Christ. Mission accomplished. It proved all that he said was true. He was truly the Son of God. He was eternal. He was divine. He was Lord of all. He would die. He would rise. It happened. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaks of the resurrection, resur- resurrection and the gospel, and he says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. This is the gospel, the good news, which I preached to you, which you also received and which you also stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And here's the gospel. I delivered to you as of first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, then to the twelve After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And then he goes on in verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. So we're not in our sins. So, yes, we, we kind of use shorthand sometimes and we say, yeah, Christ died for me. Yeah, but you have to get the second part. He rose from the dead. Otherwise, his death was not effectual to save you. It had no significance. It had no meaning. It was martyrdom. But he died and he rose again. So back to our story. The response of the women is they remembered. Ah, now we remember what he said. They saw that God had done just as he said he was going to do. And since God does just as he says he will, the lesson for us is you can trust God to do what he says he will do. Every bit of it. Every promise that He makes to you for salvation. Every promise He makes to you for for well-being. Every promise for prayer, presence, protection, whatever it is. He will do what He says He will do. If He can raise His Son from the dead, He can do anything. And what has He said He will do for you? He said this, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Believe, that means to trust. You place your trust in Him. It doesn't just mean I believe that it's true, but you place your trust in Christ. This morning, when you came in, you trusted that people driving toward you were going to stay on their side of the road, right? You didn't give it a second thought. Trusted that the lights were going to be on, the the heat or the ventilation, that the the music was going to be in order. You trusted all those things, but you didn't give it a second thought. But our trust in the Lord is a, a, a trust that we know that He really did die for you, for us, and that is where our hope lies. That is our dependence upon Him. Believe in the Lord Jesus, that He's Lord of all. And you will be saved. And being saved means rescued from from all that death, all that sin rather causes, which is death and further sin. You know, everything in this world, everything in this world, in your household, he says. Do you have kids? Do you have a spouse? Do you have grandkids? If they too believe, they too can be saved by all that he's done they place their trust in Jesus Christ. Do you realize that the resurrection is the answer to everything? 
if sin was put to death, if death died as of the resurrection of Christ, everything is about the resurrection because everything is reversed and God can do everything. You think mankind is going to solve racism? Do you think mankind is going to solve uh, climate change? Do you think mankind is going to, to solve um, political divide? Do you think mankind is going to solve death and disease? Not a chance. But pe- people put their, their hope in the next Messiah, the next mayor, the next governor, the next president, until the next one comes along because they're disappointed because the unexpected always happens. But the resurrection is the answer to everything. This world is broken beyond repair by us. And years of humanity tell us that. I mean, if we think mankind is going to change and get a hold on all the, the brokenness of this world, just look at our track record. Ain't going to happen. So you can trust him for your salvation and you can trust him for every other promise he has made to you. So God does the unexpected. And God does also everything that he says he's going to do. And God does what is necessary for us to believe. He does what is necessary for us to believe. Verses 9 through 12 says this, And the women returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the eleven, all the things, everything. We came to, to the tomb, we were expecting the stone to be there, but we found the stone was rolled away. We looked inside, there was no body. All of a sudden, these two angels appeared to us, and they told us what Jesus said, that he's alive, just as he said. And they told them everything from beginning to end. And then, and then it identifies these women for the first time by name. They were Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and also the other women with them were telling these things to the apostles. They are named here to give the, the story vividness and to tell us these are real people, not just a bunch of women, real people who are eyewitnesses. And this is their testimony of what happened. There were at least five women, maybe six or more, because it says, it names three, and then it says the other women, meaning at least two more. We know Salome was one of them, one of the other gospel, gospels tell us, but I think there were at least a half a dozen. But look at the response of the disciples. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, empty words. They're babbling. You don't make any sense. And they would not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the lemon wrappings only. And he went away to his home, marveling at what had happened. Peter wants to believe so badly. Can't imagine what's going through his mind. He's struggling to believe. And he's amazed at these things. But think about it. He was rebuked in the strongest possible way by Jesus at one point when Jesus said to him, who do you think that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, I'm going to go and I'm I'm going to be killed. And Peter said, that'll never happen. I'm not going to let that happen to you. Be killed. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. How that must have stung. God's will must be done. It was necessary. It had to happen this way. He remembers that. He remembered how Jesus said, you're going to be sifted by Satan. He remembered how he denied Jesus three times in all this. In an instant, boom, a hundred thoughts going through his mind. Can it be? To his credit, he seeks more information because he's been rash so many times. What happens next is this. It says, behold, two of them, disciples, we're going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about these things which they had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began talking with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another as you were walking? 
And they stood still, looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of all the things that have happened here in these days? And he said, What things? And they said to him the things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty indeed, in word, in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him over to a sentence of death. Notice what's happening. And they crucified him. But we were hoping that it, that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. Circumstances, you know. Yes. It wasn't as we planned. But also some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning, they did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just exactly as the women also had said, but him they did not find. And Jesus said to them, O foolish men, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken, was predicted. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and the scriptures. He walked them through those Old Testament passages and they approached the village where they were going and he acted as though he were going further but they urged him saying stay with us for it is getting toward evening and the day is now nearly over so he went in to stay with them when he had reclined at the table with them he took the bread and blessed it and breaking it he began giving it to them then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight and they said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? Then they go and they tell the other disciples. And while they're talking, he himself stood in their midst and said to them, peace be to you. They were startled and frightened and thought that they were seeing a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your heart? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe, because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, Have you anything to eat? Let me prove to you, it's really me. And he took a piece of broiled fish and he ate it right before them. Then he said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Everything. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And they did. This is the divine necessity. It was necessary for these things to happen. It was necessary for Christ to be handed over to sinful people. It was necessary for Christ to be crucified. It was necessary for Christ to be raised. And these were necessary to fulfill all Scripture. And these were all necessary for you to be forgiven and to have a relationship with Him to know him personally. Every one of us are at different stages of faith, just like these people in the story. There are some who refuse to believe, the 11. You know, it's not easy to believe the gospel at times. I mean, think about it. You have to believe that someone rose from the dead. But it's not impossible to believe. All things are possible with God. He exists. He is all-knowing, all-powerful, and in the light of the resurrection, this good news shines in the darkness of our hearts. It did for me, it did for many of you, and it may be for some of you this morning for the first time. Some are slow of heart, like the disciples on the road, maybe just not paying attention and letting unexpected disappointments of life getting in the way of knowing and walking with Jesus. Has that been your life? You know, things come up. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, 
He meets you where you are. And maybe you have unfinished business, like Peter. Guilt. I'm sure he was thinking, what does this mean? And how do we leave things? And what happens if he... Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. Your guilt is done away with. You can put it behind you in Christ. The fourth category is believing but need to be reminded, and maybe that's you, like the women. When our faith wavers, he is the one who is faithful. We get distracted. We need to be remembered over and we need to be reminded rather over and over and over again of these truths that Jesus really did die, really did rise. He really does love us. He really is coming for us, and that frames our life. And a final thought for us this morning is this. Our faith is in a person, Jesus Christ. Our faith is not in a doctrinal statement. It is not in a list of moral principles. It is not a faith in a religious organization. Yes, we hold the sound doctrine. Yes, we gather together. And yes, we live by His Word. But our faith is in Him. And 1 John 5, 11 through 13 says this, The testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has the life. He who has, does not have the Son of God does not have the life. These things I have written to you who believe on the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you have the Son of God? Is He in your life? Do you know that you have eternal life this morning? It is necessary for you to believe. And maybe you've heard this a hundred times before, but it's still necessary for you to believe. Maybe this is the morning God has opened your eyes. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank You that you fulfilled all that was necessary for our salvation in Christ Jesus. And I pray for any this morning whose eyes are open that they might say to you right now, Father, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died and rose again. I trust in him alone to be saved from my sin. Would you forgive me? And would you fulfill all your promises to me in him? I believe that this is a gift given to me by faith in you. And I believe in you now in Jesus' name. Amen.